Hello and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. In addition, today, as always, we're on Birmingham Area Municipal Access in Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and the village of Franklin. Both of our TV stations, Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 in their Community and Government Television Guide. On the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM in the greater West Bloomfield area and in Bloomfield Hills and the greater Bloomfield area, 88.1 WBFH, the Biff. You can find us online, civiccentertv.com, as well as on our Facebook pages today, facebook.com slash civiccentertv15 and facebook.com slash lakesfm. And as always, joining me from her home studio in Kegel Harbor is Ronnie Dahl. Hey, uh, Tyler, are you on Facebook? I am. Unfortunately, yes. Do you actually use it? I very seldomly use it. It'll be occasionally, oh, hey, it's someone's birthday. Let me say happy birthday to them. I haven't said happy birthday to somebody on, on here in months. Might as well break the silence. Other than that, I use it for work and it's about it. Because I will say you're like the generation that uh, Facebook, you know, for us, it, it started out like college students only. Right. I could use it. You had to have a college, uh, um, like email address oh, yeah. to be able to join Facebook. And I remember when I was a reporter, like, having to go to some of our interns when I wanted to investigate things mm -hmm. and be like, hey, can you do this, this and this because we couldn't get on. And then uh, the, uh, older people took over. Mm -hmm. And so the younger generation said, well, we're not doing that. And you guys went to Instagram and stuff. But I will say um, my husband laughs at me because he's not he doesn't use Facebook mm -hmm. at all. I think his Twitter page is hooked up to his um, Facebook. So when he tweets, okay. it goes to his yeah. Facebook, but he doesn't go on, doesn't pay attention or anything. But sometimes I post things just because I want the memories to pop up. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. A lot, a lot, sometimes I get tagged in things that are people's memories or they'll take a picture when we, you know, back in the times when we were going out and going to places and uh, having get togethers that and that, uh, that I'll be tagged in and then you know six months later I'll get the notification hey you were tagged in this photo do you want to be tagged in this photo and I'll say okay but other than that I don't even use it for that kind of stuff it's mostly just occasional posting and maybe seeing an update here and there I really think it's by far the best feature of Facebook and so yeah. nine years ago today I uh, went skydiving for the first time oh very nice have you ever been? I have not been skydiving. No, I'd like to. I'd love to. I, I'd, I'd be very excited to go jump out of a perfectly good airplane <laughs> with a parachute, of course. <laughs> I got to add that detail in there. It's, with a parachute, definitely would be interested. It was on my bucket list. And um, I will say I, I, it was tandem because uh, if I had to do it by myself, I would never, ever have enough courage to do it. Because once your feet hit the side of that plane, it's like, oh no. And then before you know it, the, your uh, partner is tossing you out of the airplane. Um, so I've been uh, one other time since then. And it was only because I bought, uh, you know, for my niece's high school graduation, I got her skydiving because she wanted to do it and she was 18. Okay. So I was like, oh, okay. And then my uh, twin sister was furious with me. Yeah, so I can understand that. So I used it instead of my niece and then got her something else. But, and I bring it up because she just graduated college. Okay. And I'm like, well, she's 22 now. Right, can we celebrate this by jumping out of an airplane together? That's, exactly. that's a good question. So is that, is that appropriate? Because I'm like, well, she's not 18 anymore. No, it's not, no, she's not like some j just became an adult and still under her parental supervision entirely. And this is probably not something, this is probably something you should run by her parents. At this point, it's like, no, you know what? I've, I've graduated, she's graduated college. She's making her own decisions. Now she's going out into the real world. She's gotta be able to make these kinds of decisions. Should I jump out of a plane with my aunt or not? That's a very adult decision to be making, Ronnie. <laughs> Right. And then, but then my other question is, do we do it and not tell my sister until after oh, it's done? That's a whole nother question. Maybe, maybe like FaceTime your sister while in midair and just, you know, have that be the big reveal. I, I will say anyone out there who's ever uh, thinking about it or considering it, uh, especially for your first time, buy the video because you are so freaked out that you, you forget what's happening. You're so panicked. And so they do a really good job. I did it in Fowlerville 
Um, and they do a really good job of having like, you know, the GoPros on you mm-hmm. and, you know, taking the video and then they have the GoPros on the plane so that it right. gets you uh, jumping and everything. And then like that, uh, you go back, boom, by the time you leave, they have the video available for you. Um, you and you'll want it because uh, you just don't remember those moments. You Like for me, I remember the panic. <laughs> Yeah, it just seems like one of those moments where you're just so full of adrenaline. You're just like, okay, let me just get through the moment here. Okay, well, that parachute's going to work. Parachute's working. Okay, am I going to land on both? The pit's not going to pop, right? It's not going to pop. Then you get on the ground. And you're like, oh, that was fun. I don't remember any of it. So, yeah, that sounds like something the video would be very helpful for. I know. I, I want to do it yeah, again. Sure. So, I think I might have to, uh, you know, is, is that uh, selfish if I want to do it again to give it as a gift for my niece? <laughs> Not really. I mean, if she's interested in, in doing that as a graduation celebration gift and, and you happen to be there with, I mean, if anything, it's in, it's encouragement. It's a moral support, like that you're jumping out of a plane. That's kind of a big step to be making someone, you know, maybe you want to have someone there that, you know, you can trust someone, someone from your family that you can jump out of that plane with. I've done it before. If anything, if anything, you're being supportive. Exactly. And speaking of airplanes, yes, Tyler. Oh no. So uh, you knew this was coming. We all knew this was coming. Uh, the governor taking the trip back in March to go uh-huh. to Florida to visit her father, whom she says was sick. Um, so the fact that like when it happened, right? So when it, it, it comes out in the public that she traveled, but remember we, there were no pictures of her during this time. So the immediate uh-huh. question was, well, we know she didn't fly commercial because you know everyone would be snapping pictures right. and it would have gotten out sooner. So uh, yesterday, uh, Charlie LaDuff uh, broke the news mm-hmm. that she borrowed a plane from some billionaires uh, to go to Florida to see her father. And again, when asked about it, the governor says, uh, I'm not going to answer these questions any longer. You know, I don't talk about my travel plans because my life uh, has been threatened. And uh, so the GOP, the Republicans are saying, hey, look, we need a little bit of transparency here because if you're borrowing a billionaire's plane, which by the way, would cost between twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 if you wanted to charter uh, a flight yourself, mm-hmm. um, then is there going to be a payback? People don't do things out of the goodness of their heart. No, especially especially when they're doing those things for people in positions of power in government, and especially when they're billionaires that have businesses they're thinking about and they're trying to to, sm- to schmooze with people in high places. So yeah, it, it's it brings up a lot of questions. Why there wasn't more transparency with this, especially in a situation where you're going down there to see your father, you're saying that you're going down there to see him because he's sick and, and you need some family assistance, which anybody with half a heart can sympathize with. But then you go down there and you charter a flight, whether you used your own money or, uh, or hopefully you didn't use any state money to do that is one, it's a whole different issue. But then you're taking a, basically a donation, so to speak, of a, of a chartered private flight from billionaires who are definitely going to come back at some point, maybe after you're reelected, maybe beforehand and say, well, time to cash in a favor for you, Governor. Remember that time we let you on the plane? It'd be a real shame if all the details of that were leaked out to the public. And I get why she's not talking about it to some extent for security reasons. There have been many threats against the governor in the past. In the past year, heck, there was a plot to kidnap and kill the governor. That being said, you can be somewhat transparent in this situation and give the, the basic details of what happened when you did travel to see your father, your sick father down in Florida without giving away all the details of how you normally travel, that could be a security risk. There are ways to navigate that, that the governor and her team absolutely know how to do. They're just, once again, avoiding being transparent, which is something the governor ran on. Yeah, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, I know some people are saying, this is net, just politics and people are being, you know, mean spirited and this, that and the other, but Valid we have questions. to remember, you know, it, yeah. And, and that's the thing, it's like, we should know that. Right, uh, and two of the three people. So this plane, according to uh, the Detroit News, they picked up the story after uh, LaDuff put it out, and yes. he wouldn't name the owners of the plane uh, due to you know 
basically kind of an agreement that he got with the source. Right. Um, and so, but the Detroit news picked it up. They did a little bit more digging. And uh, so one of the owners is connected to the Maroon family, the other two to uh, healthcare industries. And, and normally these individuals donate a lot of money to the politicians, but they really donate typically to the Republican side. So I think that raises even more red flags. But again, it goes back to the transparency with our elected leaders. And you wonder right now why so many people don't trust the government. And I think that's what we're seeing right now with the vaccine. People are saying you're not transparent and open and honest with us. You have a history of not being so. Why should we trust you when you are pushing for everyone to get a vaccine? You're saying it's safe. But at the end of the day, you're still pulling things like this. Yeah, it doesn't. It, it can't be helpful with vaccine hesitancy and, and trying to curb that problem, which at this point in time, with our COVID surges across the country and definitely here in Michigan starting to subside, getting people who are on the fence about getting a COVID-19 vaccine vaccinated so we can get to that herd immunity point and ease our way out of this pandemic is crucial. When you have government transparency issues, and this is mostly advocacy for vaccinations coming from the government down into other sectors of, of our communities, there's a very big problem there because people are not gonna trust their government if they're not being at least somewhat transparent. And if nothing else, it's not gonna help in the vaccine hesitancy uh, hesitancy issue. And if you're not helping in that situation, you're definitely hurting. So again, it goes back to government transparency. It's something that Governor Whitmer ran on and something that she has, especially during the, the pandemic and definitely in the last several months, more than more so than ever before, has been an issue. And it's an issue that's been brought up by people on both sides of the aisle, regardless of their p political affiliations, because it is something that's both necessary and required by the public from their public officials. They want to know what's going on. And if there's something that you know may be questionable, at least provide some semblance of an answer to it so that our questions are reduced. And maybe even there's a point where we can understand, yeah, you know what? You're visiting your, your family, someone is sick, you have to do it, you're being safe in the process. It's not great, but well, and some people may be more likely to let that go than making a secret trip and having to come out later. That being said, really interesting article yesterday. I think it was in uh, Deadline Detroit, correct, from uh, Charlie LaDuff. So, and with that, uh, one of the big questions raised right now, there is concern growing that can we reach that 70% herd immunity or vaccine um, requirements that yeah. the governor, governor rather has set for us to reopen Michigan. But one of the things they are looking at um, easing the COVID-19 rules if kids become vaccine eligible. So Michigan will reevaluate and potentially change recently released benchmarks tying COVID-19 vaccinations to easing pandemic restrictions if federal regulators authorize immunizations rather for children. And that's according to a health department spokesperson. So currently Michiganders 16 and older are eligible for Pfizer's uh, vaccine, but we do anticipate that that approval is going to be changed to allow for children ages 12 to 15 to also get the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. So health officials say, they have the infrastructure to accommodate the roughly 500,000 newly eligible tweens and teens here in Michigan. However, the overall decline in vaccine demand will almost delay easing COVID-19 regulations. So by increasing the pool of unvaccinated people, it will become more difficult to reach the benchmarks to adjust for the restrictions. Now, again, um, the order to hit the first benchmark in the governor's plan is 4.4 million Michiganders need to receive at least the first dose of the vaccine. And as of Thursday afternoon, the state was at 4.1 million first doses. But what we are starting to see now is that hesitancy and supply is starting to um, out benchmark the demand right now. Yeah, that's been a gro and that's been a growing problem, and, and it's part of that vaccine hesitancy we we, we talked about in the uh, it, with the issue with the governor's trip down to Florida, and more details have come out to that, and and other issues, the government transparency, and really a number of other issues also that have 
piled on to, to the vaccine hesitancy issue and as we've kind of hit this lull in vaccinations. Getting the vaccination available to more people, definitely a, definitely a positive, especially in the case of children 12 to 15 that are in the younger, the much younger end of, of uh, the problem area and the most recent surge in Michigan. But at the same time, these are minors and they're gonna have to have approval of their parents. And in the cases of some of, the, some of these kids whose parents are vaccine hesitant, they probably n are not going to consent to have their, their kids get vaccinated. So hopefully what ends up happening is these kids are able to get the vaccine, we're able to get more shots and more arms and up our numbers a little bit, but we are increasing the pool of people that can be vaccinated, which does kind of change those benchmarks and those benchmark numbers and actually increases the population of people that can be vaccinated. Well, here's a little uh, incentive for parents to vaccinate their kids. Uh, federal regulators prepare to authorize the use of the Pfizer um, coronavirus vaccine in adolescents aged 12 to 15. Top health official Wednesday said uh, vaccinated individuals in that age group will be able to remove their mask outdoors at camp. So the remarks by the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. Walensky, came after criticism that the agency's recently issued guidance for campers was too strict. So that guidance has said that children at camp should be masked, except for when eating, drinking, napping, or swimming. So the Pfizer vaccine is now authorized only for people 16 and older. The other two vaccines in use now in the U.S. are limited to those 18 and older, but federal regulators, as we, as we have been saying, are expected to expand the Pfizer authorization to include adolescents. As uh, early as possibly this week into next week, Canada just approved it for those 12 years old and older. So Dr. Wilinski said on Wednesday that the agency's guidance was intended to prevent repeat of virus outbreaks that we saw last year that were traced to the summer camp. She said that unvaccinated, unmasked children who engage in close contact sports like soccer are at risk of transmitting the virus even when outdoors. So a little bit more of an incentive for parents if and when we know it's going to get approved here for uh, you know teens and tweens, 12 and up, coming up uh, rather quickly. And so a little bit more incentive for their parents to get their kids vaccinated. Yeah, and it's good news too for these summer camps who have had to modify their program so much once again this summer as they plan for a second COVID-19 summer of their events with, less, with either less kids being available in these camps, less camps specifically being available at these, at these for example, day camps or less availability for the overnight camps, being able to have vaccinated kids that have more openness for activities out there as granted by the CDC is gonna be helpful for developing programs as well and maybe even bringing in more campers and helping with the business side of things for these camps also. So there's a lot of positives here potentially uh, if and when the Pfizer vaccine is approved for children 12 to 15. Well, it's going to be so much easier for everyone to get a vaccine because three major retailers now offering a walk-in or a scheduled COVID-19 vaccines at their Michigan stores. Uh, COVID-19 vaccines getting easier to find here in Michigan. As the three major retailers announced this week, they're offering walk-up and scheduled appointments at hundreds of their stores here in the state. CVS Health said it will have walk-in as well as same day vaccinations at its CVS pharmacy stores and nationwide, including about 300 locations here in the state of Michigan. No appointment is necessary. Same day scheduling, including appointments as soon as one hour from the time of scheduling, also available at CVS.com. Walmart, as well as Sam's Club announced they will have vaccines for customers and associates at their 115 pharmacies here in the state of Michigan with walk-ins accepted as supplies allow. Appointments, of course, could be made at walmart.com or samsclub.com. Uh, they are administering the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines. People do not have to be members uh, to receive a shot at Sam's Club, by the way. So again, it is becoming extremely easy for people that want to get the vaccine 
to be able to get it. And it appears as at least at Walmart, you'll have a choice as to which one you want to get, which we haven't always had in the past. Yeah. And you, and you'll also have the choice in some of these cases to either schedule a specific time to go and get your vaccine that will work for you or walk in at your own convenience. So that if you're getting one of the two shot vaccines, you can either schedule things out and move your schedule around or schedule the rest of your life around getting those two shots or do it at your own convenience within the time periods necessary. So there's more vaccine available. There's more flexibility and in, in choices for people to be able to make in how and when they get their vaccine and where they get their vaccine than there was earlier on. So there's plenty of opportunity for you out there if you are still in need of a COVID-19 vaccine to do so at your own convenience at a number of different places all around the local area. And of course, as always, you can find the latest headlines. Just go to civiccentertv.com, click on a coronavirus. With that, we have a lot to get to here on the Friday edition. Coming up next, we'll be speaking with the treasurer for Ride of Silence. So many more people are biking right now. Why should you, safety be a big concern? And also, what is the right of silence? How does that work? We'll be talking with the treasurer coming up here next. And then following him, we'll be speaking with the director of education and stewardship for the Clinton River Watershed Council. That's coming up next here in the 10 o'clock hour of the Megacast. Wearing a mask is more than protection. It's a bridge to better days. The path back to celebrations with family. Nights out on the town with friends. <laughs> Game days with your favorite sports teams. And the thrill of live concerts. But until we can all get the COVID-19 vaccine and build community immunity, which will take time, we all need to continue to stay careful. Because Michigan's recovery is depending on you. And so are your family, friends, and neighbors. So even after you're vaccinated, wear a mask, avoid large gatherings, and social distance. One day in the near future, we will all be able to put this pandemic behind us. But until then, spread hope, not COVID. Learn more at michigan.gov coronavirus. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. In times like these, we have to believe in each other. And we believe that you'll do the right thing. When it comes to stopping the spread of COVID. Follow the three W's. Wear a mask. Wash your hands. Watch your distance. And when it's your turn to get the vaccine, take your shot. It all comes down to the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. We're so close, Michigan. We can do this together. Welcome back to the Mega Cast. Uh, we want to remind you we're always here Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon. If you're unable to catch the show, you can always watch previous episodes of the Mega Cast on CivicCenterTV.com. Just click on the Mega Cast tab, or if you want to watch the individual interviews, you can do so as well by clicking on On Demand. Uh, for so many of us throughout the pandemic, We've been enjoying nature and getting outdoors. And one way we've been doing that is by hopping on our bicycles. The last year at this time, it was hard to find a bicycle. They were being sold out. But did you also know that in 2019, more than 49,000 bicyclists were injured here in the United States involved in motor vehicle crashes? And sadly, over 800 people died. To talk more, let's bring in Dave Duffield. He's the treasurer for Ride of Silence. Dave, great to have you with us here. Thanks for having me, Ronnie. For those not familiar with Ride of Silence, give us a little bit of background. Well, it was started back uh, by Chris Phelan um, back in, oh gosh, 2003. <clears throat> a good friend of his, Larry Schwartz, was killed by a school bus mayor. And after that, he sent a, a couple of uh, emails around to friends who obviously forwarded them on to other people. And over a thousand people showed up for a ride about, uh, oh gosh, to, to 16 days later. Wow, that really is amazing. And since then, this has grown um, internationally. Yes, it's, 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 it's worldwide. I, have, I don't remember exactly how many rides there are this year, but it's all over the globe. So if we could talk about that, did you have the ride last year with the pandemic? We did. 
We did. It was very, it was, there weren't very many people, but yes. And then actually, I think uh, uh, some of the news uh, channels covered it as well. So with that, um, when is the ride going to be this year and how many people do you anticipate will participate? It will be uh, May 19th at 7 p.m. And this year, it, we might get quite a few more because um, uh, a, a prominent cyclist um, whose, whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, Frankie, uh, Frankie Andreu from Dearborn is going to, is going to you know, be, be there. That's, uh, that's good to know. Uh, for those that don't know, Frankie um, actually used to uh, be a major cyclist. In fact, he rode in the Tour de France, was on Lance Armstrong's yeah. team. Um, I've interviewed him once or twice, really uh, just a really nice guy. And to think that his career started right here in our own backyard. And uh, what have you seen as a result of the pandemic? Are more people cycling right now? Oh, it's 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 amazing. Uh, the 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 path that I live very close to the airline trail, when it, the first the pandemic first started, there were so many people out there. You had to be very very careful riding your bicycle. They had walkers, all kinds of people. Dave Duffield with us here on the Mega Cast. He's the treasurer for the Ride of Silence. And how does it work? I know there are several different um, rides even here within the state of Michigan. Yeah, uh, basically, you, you, there, there's oh gosh, they're, they're all over the state. But basically, it's a, it's there's no cost. You just show up. Um, you know, we encourage uh, family members who've lost somebody to participate. Um, and it's basically you ride quietly. Uh, you know, the route. It's not. It's gosh, like ten miles an hour and ten miles maximum. What is the typical length? Uh, it's you know usually. 12 or 10 miles or under. So for people that aren't uh, experienced cyclists. Exactly. You don't have to be a, you know, a, a pro cyclist to, to ride this ride. That's not and, what it's about. And, and with that too, um, Dave, if I can talk to you, how many have you participated in now? Oh gosh. Uh, a good friend of mine started, he, the, the ride I remember, he's a, a fellow, a, a, a friend and, and he's also my bike club. He's, he wrote it in, two, he, he did it in 2006. And Chris Phelan, the, the founder, tells me that I, <clears throat> I was the very first one to have one here in Michigan. I'm not so sure that's true, but, you know, anyway, it's, it's gone on for quite a few years. What was it like for you, though? Emotional? Uh, it was. I mean, I've, I've been hit by a car, not, not injured. My bike was injured, but, um, but I mean, I really feel for people that have, you know, that have lost their lives or lost family members to this. It's, it's you know, we have to learn to share the road. Uh, the state, state law says we have every right to be on the road as, as a car does, but, you know, you need to be careful. So with that, Dave, uh, can I ask as well, because it does appear, um, you know, even here, I'm in the Kiko Harbor area. We don't have, other than the trail, you have the West Bloomfield Trail, but even riding on the, ro the road, we don't have a lot of bike paths. And uh, is this something that really needs to be addressed in the state of Michigan, as well as across the nation, to make these bike paths so that cyclists feel safer? Well, it's, it's uh, as you probably already know, Detroit has dedicated a lot of bike lanes in, in, on roadways in Detroit. Um, Todd Scott's very, uh, he's very active in the Detroit cycling scene. Um, but yes, the Michigan Trails and Greenways Alliance has worked for years to connect trails so that you can actually get on a trail and go somewhere. But yes, I mean, it's, it's, if you ride on the road, you need to be, you know, you need to be careful, but obviously a trail is, is ideal because you don't have to share it with the cars. And with that though, Dave, we have so many people uh, more so now than ever, I think on bicycles, uh, so many kids as well. Um, bike safety, we learn it when we're little kids. Right. But then it, it just seems to go away. Yeah, Le League of Michigan Bicycles is working on that and it has been for years. Uh, they produce a little booklet, What Every Bicyclist Should Know, and that's distributed all over the place. You can pick one up free. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, you're right. It, the cyclists need to understand how to ride. And that's one thing I stress during my ride is, you know, don't miss a teachable moment when you come up upon a rider that's wearing black clothing they're on a bike that doesn't fit them. They're obviously just using this bicycle for 
you know, get to their job, whatever, you know, remind these people, no, no, we're, we're bright colored clothing, have lights. You know, that's the only thing that's going to keep you alive. Hey, I don't know how many times I've almost hit a cyclist just because of what you just talked about, especially Absolutely. at dusk. Yes, yes. That's one of the most dangerous times, actually, because, you know, reflectors and lights at dusk, it's kind of everything blends in. Whereas at night, you actually see a blinking light, blinking red light very, you know, well. But yeah, dusk is a dangerous time. Dave Duffield with us here on the Megacast. He's the treasurer for Ride of Silence, an event that is coming up here later in the month. Uh, really, the desire is to recognize those that have lost their lives um, on their bikes and being involved in accidents, but also safety, bicycle safety. It does seem that when we come, when it comes to wearing helmets, it's becoming more of a routine now than when I grew up. When I grew up, yes. no one wore a helmet. Now, pretty much most people you see have a helmet. Yes, thankfully. Yeah, well, one thing that always bothers me, I see a, a young family and, and the kids will have hel helmets on and mom and dad won't. And I, I wanna come up, I, I have to bite my tongue because I wanna say to them, where are you gonna be when you get a closed head, head injury and you're at the mentality of a five-year-old, where are your kids gonna be then? You know, wear, wear the helmets like you make your kids wear, wear their helmets. Uh, yeah, when you're it, right. They're much, they're much more widely used now, which is a good thing. And can you talk a little bit about the helmets? Um, because it's not just enough to put a helmet on. It should fit properly as well. Absolutely. I've seen a lot of kids, you know, with the helmets hanging on off the back of their head. And, and it's like the, the chin strap should be tight enough where if you open your mouth, you can pull, feel the, pull, the helmet pull down on your head. It should be that tight. Dave Duffield with us here on the Mega Cast. He's the treasurer for the Ride of Silence. And um, with that, uh, Dave, you kind of mentioned people riding bikes that aren't the right bike for them. What do you mean by that? Uh, the, basically, the frame size or, or the seat adjustment. You see a lot of people. You know, like a lot of people will will want to put their feet on the ground when they're on the seat. I can understand that, but when they pedal, they'll find, you'll find that their, their legs are not extending all the way like they should be. You get a lot of mechanical advantage. You, you, you can, you can it's, it's okay to have your, if you're not on the seat, you're on the top bar to have your feet on the ground. But yeah, when you're on the seat, you really shouldn't have your feet, have, have your feet be able to touch the ground. I will say, and just some of the things you mentioned, I already know I'm doing things wrong. And can we just clarify here? Do you ride with traffic or Absolutely. against traffic? Absolutely with it. The state law requires you to ride with traffic. Riding against traffic is actually against the law. And a lot of people like to do that because they can say, oh, I can see the car coming. However, if a car hits your handlebar on that side, it'll turn your wheel into the car. And if you get, if you're driving with traffic, if a car does happen to hit you, it, it will send you away from the traffic lane. So, and I think when we grew up, we were taught, like back in the day, you ride against traffic. Right. Um, right. You know, so these things change as more science becomes available. If a sidewalk is available, should they ride on the sidewalk? Well, y yes, I, I, I ride on the sidewalk very often. Um, when, when we were going to work, I would ride sidewalks mostly to work. However, with sidewalks, you also have to be very careful because, as you know, most people do not stop at the stop line at an intersection. So if you're crossing, say, a road and, you know, you have the, the right of way, you've got to be very careful that people see you and that, you know, when you cross, the, when you cross over to the other sidewalk on the other side. You know, so, it's funny because we teach our children to ride on the sidewalk and it can be very dangerous to ride on the sidewalk. Yeah, it plus it's you know, when we come to those uh, sections of the road too, and the, you have the bushes and they're tall yes. and you don't see around the corner. Yes. Um, and, and so with that, Dave, too, tell us more about you're a part of a writing group. Is it better if I'm going to go out? Should I make sure I'm with other people? It, it helps because you're more visible. You know, a lot of drivers, they're, all they're looking for is cars. And I, I know um, motorcyclists also have, have the same problem. If, if, if their vehicle, you know, if, you, if the thing you're riding isn't big enough, people don't tend to notice it, which, which is, is too bad, but that's, that's the world, you know, that's, that's reality. So with that too, when we're looking at um, riding out on the roadway, 
especially around here, I can think of like a middle belt and they, they kind of come up the hill or around a corner. Sometimes it can be hard if you come around and there's a cyclist and then all of a sudden you have to hit your brakes. Um, what advice do you give to drivers? And if there are cyclists, should the cyclists get over to let traffic pass? Well, or the, people the, just need to slow down. The law, the law reads, uh, f- ride to the right as far as practically, it's a funny word, practically possible. But you also should not put yourself in danger about coming too close to the curb as well. It's all hard because every roadway is different. Yes, yes. Some have um, nice shoulders, some don't. Right, yeah. And with that too, um, Dave, if for drivers, what is the the biggest time or the most dangerous time that some of these accidents happen? Is it early in the morning, late at night? A lot of them happen, you know, as you say, at dusk and into the night. And so with that, we should remind people too, obviously, as it starts to get a lot warmer out, we see uh, someone, so many more people um, taking advantage of that warm weather and getting out on their bicycles. Hey, Ed, can I ask you while you're here, your thoughts on uh, some of the electric bicycles that we're seeing pop up uh, a lot of places? I know we have them a lot on the trail as well. Yeah, they're, they're, they've gotten hugely popular. And, you know, at first, if, you, if you're a dyed-in-the-wool cyclist, you know, a lot of people are, come on, man, that's cheating. However, it, you know, with a lot of our old, older cyclists, if, if it gets them back out on riding, hey, I'll, I'm all for it. Right. And, and on, some of them are pretty fast, too, so you, you got to be careful. Right. And with that, too, you know, we show some people still use their bicycles as a mode of transportation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Dave, give us an update. How can people find out more about uh, the ride that's coming up and also do they need to sign up is there a fee give us those details there's no such fee um no fee at all you can just go to the ride of silence.org uh and and there's a uh what the web page and and tells all about it all the different locations here in michigan and 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 across the united states and worldwide so again uh, the dates here in michigan is is may 19th the third or second wednesday in, in may and um, it's at 7 p.m. I ask everybody to be there at least 6.30. And uh, with that too, we want to remind people that if you are going to participate, please make sure, especially at seven o'clock at night, that you wear a helmet. And, uh, it, and I would imagine that you're also recommending uh, people have all the safety gear as well. Yes, lights as well, absolutely. I will say one of our biggest pet peeves on the trail, people on bicycles and they don't ring their bells to right. let you know that they're coming up behind you. Right. The, the, if, if you don't have a bell, what you should say is passing on your left. So they know that you're coming around them. Right. It's a courtesy. Plus, you know, for us, when you're walking your dog, you never know if they're going to lunge. Exactly. And, uh, exactly. <laughs> you know, you don't want to, just like you don't want to have an accident, um, you know, with a motor vehicle, we do know there are people that uh, have biking accidents as well. I had a friend, he went over the front of his handlebars, broke a few ribs. Uh, it, it was not a pleasant experience. So safety measures all around. Absolutely. Yeah. We, out by me, we also have, there's a horse farm out west of me and occasionally you'll see a horse out there. You, you don't want to spook them either on your bicycle. <laughs> No. So too, can you talk a little bit too, is it more dangerous sometimes too for people? Because uh, I know a lot of people like to take advantage of going out into the country, but sometimes I worry about that because the cars can come out of nowhere and they tend to speed on the country roadways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, I have uh, some friends in, in my club that do a lot of gravel riding. So they'll go out and you know, on country roads and stuff. And, you know, there again, it's just a matter of being visible, using lights and, and you know, and, and I, I use a, a, a rear view mirror on my, my sunglasses so I can see what's coming behind me. I, in, in fact, I recommend everybody use them because you, you, you know, if, if, if when you hear an engine noise, you can look back and see, oh, are they, you know, are they going to squeeze me here? And then you can make a fast exit off the road if need be. So with that, Dave, uh, too, have you noticed more accidents because people are wearing headphones and they don't hear that traffic? That's one of been my pet peeves for years. I worked with MDOT uh, years ago to refurbish the I-275 path. 
And, you know, obviously along I-75, the traffic noise is significant and you come upon people and you even yell on your left and they don't hear you. And that's, that's a, a big problem. I mean, your hearing is very, very important when you ride a bicycle, you can hear the cars coming. If you've got head, if you've got earbuds in, you can't. So with that, uh, Dave Duffield with us here on the Megacast, he's the treasurer for Ride of Silence. It is an annual event that takes place uh, not only here in Michigan, but across the country and across the world. Uh, it started in 2003 as a way to honor Larry Schwartz, who was killed uh, by the mirror on a bus, school bus, and it has continued to grow. And uh, really one of the aims is to recognize those that have lost their lives and have been injured, but also uh, to talk about safety awareness. So uh, Dave, we so appreciate your time here on the Megacast. Ronnie, thank you. Good luck with the ride this year, be safe. And uh, um, again, that ride is going to be happening May 19th at 7 p.m. Thanks again, Dave. Thank you. We're gonna take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Kathleen Sexton. She's the Director of Education and Stewardship for the Clinton River Watershed Council. That's next here on the Megacast. Quitting smoking can improve your health, but it also protects your loved ones from secondhand smoke. Did you know there's no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke? Smoke from cigarettes, e-cigs, and hookah can travel through ventilation systems and harm those around you. So clear the air and stop secondhand smoke. Call the Michigan Tobacco Quit Line at 1-800-784-8669. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I want to get back to seeing my grandbabies every Sunday and smothering them with big hugs and kisses. I want to get back to football games with my boys. I want to get back to feeling and touching, connecting with the people around me. I want to get back to family dinners and my grandma's mac and cheese. I want to get back to real grocery shopping. Taking my time, walking down every aisle, smelling the tomatoes and melons, having a free sample or two or three. COVID-19 has changed how we live and how we feel. But now there are vaccines and they are the first step that let us get back to feeling optimistic about the days ahead of us. It's okay to have questions. Is it safe? Should I get it? Should I wait? Now get the facts. Learn more at getvaccineanswers.org so you can make an informed decision when vaccines are available to you. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Thank you for taking time out of this Friday to be with us here on the Megacast. As a reminder, you can always catch us Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon live. Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Uh, if you have cable, You'll find us on channel 15 if you have Comcast, 99 on AT&T. You can also listen to us on the radio. If you're out driving around 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 <laughs> FM The Biff, and uh, to make things even easier, you can catch us on Facebook where we live stream the Megacast on our social media Facebook page as well. For so many of us, nature has helped see us through this pandemic and we need to take care of nature. Hopefully for all of us, we have come to appreciate mother nature so much more. Kathleen Sexton joins us now. She's the Director of Education and Stewardship for the Clinton River Watershed Council. Kathleen, great to have you with us again. Good morning, Ronnie. Thank you for having me. So I know when we talked before, I think when people hear Clinton River watershed. They just think of this one little area, but the watershed really covers a very large area. Yeah, the watershed, so the Clinton River watershed covers 760 square miles of southeast Michigan. It's a very large portion, and when we're talking about a watershed, we're not only talking about the rivers, lakes, and streams, but we're talking about the land and the land use and the buildings and everything within that region. So uh, with that, tell us how you and your team are doing over the past year. So we've been doing well. We've adapted uh, along with everybody else. So, you know, March of 2020, we swiftly transitioned to working from home. 
Um, and then when we started to get into some of the warm weather months and out of the woods in terms of the stay at home orders, we transitioned to a lot of outdoor workshops and things like that, which I think was uh, a blessing. I mean, we realized, you know, we were teaching a lot of you know, using PowerPoint presentations and informational resources, and we were able to adapt a lot of that to outdoor learning, which what better way to learn about the outdoors than being outdoors. So have you found that people are more interested because they have been spending more time outdoors? We've had really great uh, participation in some of these events, and we've been able to be a little bit flexible in what we're doing. So we had a soundscape ecology workshop last summer. We'll be having another one in July, which is a way to um, actually go outdoors and listen to your environment. Um, and that helps you gauge what's going on and the health of the environment and how things are working together. You can also hear, you know, human noises, you know, it's um, anthropogenic noises, but basically road noise and talking and, and things like that. It's a very interesting way to engage with the outdoors. I will tell you the birds outside of our door, they have a party each and every day. I don't yeah. know what's going on, but that party starts bright and early. Yep. <laughs> and they yeah, are they very be, loud. They can be pretty loud. Yes. So it's interesting to, to listen to that. So with that, um, how has it been for you and the team to try to get enough volunteers? We have had some good volunteer turnout. Um, it's been a little bit less because we usually work with some corporate volunteers, corporate sponsors like GM and FCA, which is now Stellantis. Um, and their programs were pretty much shut down um, last year due to safety precautions. And those were helpful in, in getting, you know, large groups of volunteers, like 50 to 100 volunteers doing cleanups. But our every week we have a weekly clean event from 10 to noon, and we've still had pretty good regular turnout for those cleanup events. With the pandemic, so many more people are spending more time at home. Uh, but what what has the impact been on our waterways here through the past year? I would say. Um, you know, in general, we're always working to promote, you know, healthy water on a large scale in terms of restoration projects, but also on an individual scale. So actions you can take at home. And I, I would say that as people are spending more time outdoors and being connected to the water, they're also being mindful about, you know, taking care of it and making sure they, you know, leave no trace, pick up that after themselves, maybe pick up litter when they see it, things like that. What's been heartbreaking is to see some of the video when people don't properly dispose of some of the trash, especially the mask, um, where, you know, because of the loops, sometimes if it makes its way into the waterway, we know that, uh, you know, the fish, it can be devastating to some of the um, wildlife as well. It is true. So things like masks and plastic bags and, um, you know, the six pack plastic rings, they are detrimental to wildlife. We have cleanups throughout the summer, one every month on a Friday called Trash Runs, where we actually get into canoes and kayaks and we pick up trash from the river specifically. Um, and that way we're actually, you know, trying to protect wildlife and fish and things like that. So um, it's a great way for volunteers to get involved directly there. And plus it's outdoors. It, that really seems like such a great thing to do with your kids. Yes, so we have a lot of family friendly events. Uh, we have our online cleanups that are family friendly. Trash runs are specifically limited to 14 or older. Some of the stretches of the river that we navigate are a little um, technical, I suppose. You know, the Clinton River is actually pretty, uh, you know, it's considered an adventure paddle through portions of the river because it's not like the Asabo. Uh, it's narrow, it's windy, it can be a little bit fast. But we do have other family-friendly events and cleanups for people to participate in as well. Kathleen Sexton with us here on the Mega Cash. She's the Director of Education and Stewardship for the Clinton River Watershed Council. Uh, Kathleen, um, for the parents out there that may be interested, how can they find more information? Absolutely. So you can visit our website, crwc.org. We have an event coming up um, in June, on June 12th, called River Day but there's actually events that are happening throughout the month of June. And we put together a really convenient guide. It's uh, this year, it's about three pages uh, up to almost 25 different events. And nearly all of them are family friendly. 
most of them are free. And so it's a good way for parents and families to kind of look through the guide, see what's in their area and choose what they decide to go to. Can we talk about volunteers? How can they uh, sign up? Do you need volunteers right now? We always need volunteers. So if you want to volunteer for a cleanup, we have uh, our weekly clean events. Again, you can either visit our website or um, call. I mean, the website has all the locations or you can call our office. Um, the website's a better option right now because we are still working from home mostly, but we're intermittently in the office. There's no registration required to sign up for a cleanup and um, they're free for volunteers to attend, obviously. So we know this time last year, we were really still in the beginning stages in the middle of the uh, pandemic. This summer, we're starting to come out of it. There is hope more people are being vaccinated. Do you anticipate that's going to change anything um, on the side for your organization? I do. I mean, I can already see the changes. This time last year, we weren't doing any in-person events, even outdoors. Um, we had transitioned to a lot of virtual events. We created a new program called the Clinton River Quest, which we're also doing again this year. It launches June 1st. That's also a family-friendly event. Um, but we are anticipating hopefully seeing some more um, engagement with the community, a lot more outdoor uh, workshops. Um, we still require masks outside just to be safe. Um, but most of the time it's never been an issue. So what is the uh, Clinton River Quest? So the Clinton River Quest is a self-led scavenger hunt. So we, um, it's, it's, you know, we have tiered pricing. So it's $15 for an indiv individual to register, $20 for two people and $40 for a family of four. And then it's just $10 for each additional ticket. And you get a t-shirt, you can get a water bottle or a gift card to Plants for Ecology, and you get an information booklet that has 50 different activities to choose from. You complete 10, and then you've considered, you know, you're a, a river ranger. So you get a little sticker. It's really fun, and it's a great way to get outside and visit different areas of the watershed and learn what we have going on in all the different areas. That is so fun, a river ranger. Yeah. Yep. So how long do they have to uh, complete it? So it actually, they have the whole summer. It launches in June and concludes in September. I will say it's not something that can be done in a weekend. It probably will take, you know, a couple of days. And we also have, um, you know, different options for people that are uh, differently abled or if they don't have a car or things like that. There are other ways that you can get involved and other um, choices that you can make to, to help complete your quest. Kathleen Sexton with us on the Mega Cast. She's the Director of Education and Stewardship for the Clinton River Watershed Council. Kathleen, we know that uh, so many organizations, including yours, went virtual last year. Do you anticipate as we come out of the pandemic, you're going to keep some of the programs that you created in the middle of the pandemic, post-pandemic? I do anticipate that we will. Um, we've actually seen a really great turnout and a lot of our virtual events, um, you know, sometimes, especially if we're going to an area that's kind of far, let's say we're visiting Chesterfield, um, which is very kind of far east, we might not get, and, and you know, New Haven, Chesterfield, they're smaller uh, villages and townships, so we might not get a huge turnout. But now if we're doing a virtual program, somebody from, you know, Hugo Harbor or Springfield Township or even Rochester Hills could attend that program and not have to drive you know, 40, 40 minutes. Um, so I do think that the virtual programming has been very successful. Um, we'll obviously still be offering in-person programming as well, as long as um, we're allowed to do that safely. So do you think uh, because so many people are enjoying nature more that it's helped bring awareness to the watershed and the work that you do? I do. I think that we've engaged a lot of new people over the last year, which is excellent. Um, and a lot of our dedicated members and volunteers are still with us as well. And I think that people have really come to appreciate the natural resources that we have here in Southeast Michigan. Um, a lot of people think you need to drive four hours north to visit something beautiful, but really the Clinton River and all of the paddling resources, the public parks, and the bike trails and walking paths um, right here in your community are just as valuable and just as, as beautiful.
And for a lot of it too, you know, the cost, it's very accessible to everyone within the region. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of money on lodging and, and commuting. You can just, you know, visit your local park or take a bike ride or a walk and, and visit some of the natural resources we have right here. So if I'm out, what should I be looking for? Um, well, we have lots of different parks. We've got um, the Metro Parks are a really good partner of ours. I guess it just depends on what your flavor is. You know, if you like to fish, if you like to paddle, if you like to, to bike or walk or just hike, um, if you're a birder, you know, there's something for everybody. So depending on what um, you enjoy, there's something for you, you know, in your community. SEMCOG Park Finder, which SEMCOG is the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments. They have a park finder website and it has a really, it's a really great tool to see what's around you and what amenities are at each park. So with that too, do you have any apps that you recommend to parents to help educate their kids? Let's see, educational apps. I can't think of any apps specifically. I know that the Michigan DNR um, launched a nature at home and um, an outdoor classroom website last summer. It's really useful, short videos. Um, that are impactful and fun. We have some videos on our website too that we've created for uh, students to use at home. And um, as far as apps, I know there's an app called All Trails, which is a way to look up which trails you can visit in a specific area. It tells you the location of the trailhead, how easy or difficult it is, the length, things like that. So I think that's really important when you're going out is just you know trying to get as much information ahead of time to make sure that you don't get yourself in a sticky situation where you're on a trail or, you know, a pad, a paddling a part of the river that you're not comfortable in. We're uh, speaking with Kathleen Sexton. She's the Director of Education and Stewardship for the Clinton River Watershed Council. Kathleen, just another minute or two here with you on the Megacast. Anything maybe I didn't ask that you want to touch on before we say goodbye? Sure. I will mention, um, as far as educational opportunities, next Tuesday, May, May 12th, I believe. I keep getting my dates mixed up. Um, it's the Lake St. Clair Water Festival. So this is usually an in-person event where we bring fourth and fifth grade students from all over Macomb County. And um, we, we take them to Macomb Community College and they get to go to different presentations throughout the day. They get you know breakfast and lunch and it's a lot of fun. But we are not able to do that in person again this year. We usually have about 1500 kids and just can't see that happening. So we're doing it virtually. We're going to have five live presentations between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. And um, we have a, a website. It's lakestclairwaterfestival.org. But this is free and open to the public. Um, we do have schools. We have about 50 schools registered. Um, so we're going to be able to educate our fourth and fifth grade students still um, virtually about water resources, recycling, things like that. So uh, also, it's the 50th anniversary. Yep, so we are gonna be celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. The Watershed Council was established in December of 1971. It was actually uh, local governments and wastewater treatment plant operators. And this was right before the Clean Water Act was passed. So water quality really started to become a priority. Uh, so we are ramping up our plans. We're gonna be launching um, our first event around June. So we're still in the planning stages. We're kind of, um, we're doing it at the tail end of the year and maybe even a little bit at the beginning of 2022 in hopes that we'll be able to have some um, in-person celebration if we hold off a little bit on the big celebration. Fingers crossed uh, we, we will get there to be able to enjoy in-person events again. Yes, absolutely. Kathleen Sexton, Director of Education and Stewardship for the Clinton River Watershed Council. Thank you, Kathleen, for taking time to be with us today. Thank you, Ronnie. And again, if you want to find out more information, you can do so. Their website, crwc.org. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, we'll be speaking with the general manager for the Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation. That's next here on the Megacast. Over a decade ago, the journey to a COVID vaccine began. Building upon research on other coronaviruses, scientists continued with months of research and development three phases of clinical trials with tens of thousands of diverse volunteers, then peer review and authorization to deliver a safe and effective vaccine that will protect all of us. 
Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. Quitting smoking can improve your health, but it also protects your loved ones from secondhand smoke. Did you know there's no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke? Smoke from cigarettes, e-cigs, and hookah can travel through ventilation systems and harm those around you. So clear the air and stop secondhand smoke. Call the Michigan Tobacco Quit Line at 1-800-784-8669. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. You're listening to 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. As a reminder, you can always catch us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, as well as Channel 15 on Comcast 99 on AT&T. We want to uh, thank you again for joining us. And as a reminder, you can also catch previous interviews on Civic Center TV as well. Uh, we are the Motor City. And with that, nothing documents the history of the automotive industry like the Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation. Joining us now on the show, let's bring in Cynthia Jones. She's the general manager. Great to have you with us. Thank you so much. It's great to be back. It really is not only a national historic landmark, but one of the biggest gems that we have here in Metro Detroit but how has the museum been doing in the middle of the pandemic? You know, so we've been back open since July of last year and we just keep slowly growing back. So we really think about it as revitalizing our teams, revitalizing the exper experience for folks, but always putting safety first. So safety for our team, safety for our volunteers, safety for our guests. And things are going slower than I'd like, you know, because I love to have folks visiting us. Um, but I think that is good because people have been taking it safe with us. So with that, Cynthia, I wonder too, like throughout this time, have you been able to go and kind of dig through the closets? Because we know a lot of museums have so much more than what's on display. Have you been able to get behind the doors and kind of explore? You know, it's interesting that you asked that question because we uh, just last week finished moving all of our, we've had um, offsite storage in, you know, we're, we have a lot of stuff, 26 million or so artifacts. Um, so we've had lots of, um, lots of closets all over the Dearborn area. Last week, uh, we finished moving all of them on site into a new uh, massive fantastic storage space so we've been discovering things that we may not have remembered were in our collections um, but also we've been actively collecting during this time period so we asked people to send us artifacts send us their stories of what it has been like to live through this pandemic um, and so we've been actively collecting there we've also been actively collecting because as you know we all know um, social issues have been really at the forefront of so much our of our lives in the last year, year and a half. And so we've collected lots of things about social protest as well. well. What a fascinating job you must have. Cynthia Jones with us. She's the general manager for the Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation. If someone hasn't been there uh, in a few years, because we know a lot of schools will take kids mm -hmm. there as part of a field trip when you're young, if you haven't been, and uh, so many families have more hand, time on their hands because they're not traveling or maybe just not doing those work trips that they once did, what will they experience if they come into the Henry Ford right now? Sure, absolutely. So our main museum is open seven days a week. Our giant screen theater experience, uh, formerly the IMAX, is open um, Thursdays through Sundays with great educational films. Greenfield Village is definitely our gem, especially this time of year. Um, it's our outdoor living history museum. That is also open right now, Thursday through Sundays. And our Ford Rouge factory tour is open, so you can see F-150 production. So there's a lot of choices. Um, the real key for folks to think about as they plan to come down and visit us, you know, just like the governor is suggesting, we encourage everyone to vaccinate who can. 
right? So vaccination is our path back for tourism and we definitely encourage that. Um, beyond that, we are requiring since we're, um, we do uh, have folks who get in somewhat close contact either with our presentation staff or you know, with each other, we do encourage you and require you to wear a mask during your visit um, unless you're eating or drinking at one of our fabulous restaurants. Um, so, but you know, really it feels a lot like the best of your past visits. You know, so if you're in Greenfield Village right now, you're going to see our horse carriages driving around. You're going to be able to buy a ticket and get on the, the steam locomotive. You can go up to and in many of our buildings. You'll get to interact with staff. Uh, similarly, in the museum, you know, you get to do all these things that, that are wonderful. What's interesting about the indoor museum right now is this is our very lowest visitation. And so folks have tons of room to spread out. You know, I said uh, Monday afternoon, I was in there later in the afternoon. I said, wow, it's almost like you're having a private visit because there's so few indoors right now. That really is, uh, so. I mean, what a way to experience it as yeah. well without the crowds. So again, one of the upsides of mm -hmm. the pandemic. I, uh, my husband uh, went with my niece and nephew to the Marvel exhibit, <sighs> raved the entire time. Um, I, I know that that one, uh, that's gone now, right? What's next? Yep, so, um, so the Marvel exhibition had moved on. Um, we just completed a display about Tiffany Glass and what we're building right now, uh, which opens uh, June 5th is Jim Henson Imagination Unlimited. So if you were inspired by Sesame Street, the Muppets, Labyrinth, Dark Crystal, all of those amazing, amazing puppeting experiences, we dig in. It's about 7,000 square foot exhibition. It's going to be fantastic. So when you're trying to put on one of these uh, exhibits, how do you come up with which ones you want to display? It, it just seems like so much goes into it. Yeah, there is a tremendous amount. So um, we like to partner. So this one is an exhibition that has traveled uh, across the country, similarly to Marvel. Um, so we'll partner with folks that we know do really good educational but fun content. Um, I think Henson is a great example because I think if you come, we know a lot of times it's actually the grandparents who bring the, the youngsters with them, but also families. Um, and to be able to have that multi-generational connection, all of us know who Kermit the Frog is, right? And so all of us have that moment when you come around the corner and you see Kermit and it's just, oh my gosh. So we look for things that people can share a conversation around um, that you can learn, but you can also have a good time, especially for the summer. We know folks kids who've been learning online all year, who've been working with this, maybe they want to have a little mental break, have a little more fun, have a little more physical opportunities. Uh, so we have uh, hands-on puppeting inside the exhibition. So we'll have, obviously, we'll have all the ways you can clean your hands and we'll be cleaning the puppets and all that. But you'll be able to, if you choose to, um, find out what it's like to puppet on TV. It's not something I think I'd be good at. I think my face might pop up into the <laughs> into the camera angles, and uh, but I think you know some good fun learning. Um, looking ahead, actually, to this fall, we're actually doing our own show. So we also produce our own shows. Um, we're looking at new acquisitions because, as I mentioned, we're always adding to our collections. Um, and then looking into next winter, uh, we'll be doing an Apollo show about going to the moon. So it gives us opportunities to really stretch beyond our own great content. Well, really the uh, museum is so much about inspiration and innovation. And we've seen that happen throughout the pandemic because for some people it was a time to escape the rat race of day-to-day -day life and to become creative throughout this time. You know, it absolutely has been. I think, you know, you can tell from my background, if you're watching on the television today, um, I'm actually working from home today. And that is not something that I would have gotten to do pre-pandemic. And so thinking about 
you know, the ways that we spend our time more purposefully right now, I think is something we're definitely hearing from our guests. Um, people are making choices about what they support, what they want to keep running. Um, and we definitely, you know, as a nonprofit museum organization, we value that so much. You know, folks have have said, we trust you, we trust you to work with us to be safe, and we're going to help keep you open and keep you moving. And, you know, similarly, when I spend my time out there in the community, I'm looking at those organizations I want to support. Cynthia Jones with us here on the Megacast. She's the general manager for the Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation. And, you know, Cynthia, I know it's early in the conversation, but we do know a lot of organizations are talking about uh, requiring possibly a vaccination for some of their guests to attend or to come into events. Do you anticipate that could happen at the museum or it's just too early to talk about that? You know, so we follow the CDC guidelines very closely. We obviously are, are very engaged with Michigan's travel and tourism industry and with the, the state government officials and economic officials. We're tracking on this. Um, I suspect that we're going to lean into the encouraging you to do it because it truly is the path back to opening all of things that we want to have open, right? You know, all of us want to be able to go to large car shows, if that's our thing, or to be able to go to the art festival or the state fair, or, you know, and I think that we understand that the best way to do that right now is to get vaccinated. Um, we recently did an anonymous poll within our own staff and volunteer corps, and the numbers were incredible. You know, our folks who have been there, who've been on site, who've been working with the public, they jumped on it. They got those vaccinations. They are, they're protecting themselves and protecting the community that comes to visit us. We hope that guests will do similarly. Uh, with that, uh, Cynthia Jones here with us on the Mega Cast from the Henry Ford Museum. Uh, with that, um, can we say uh, we're hearing so much right now about electric vehicles yeah. and autonomous vehicles? How do you think the changing of the automotive industry is going to play into the museum? Uh, yeah, great question. So, at the Ford Dish Factory Tour, which is at the Dearborn Truck Plant, you know, right there with Ford Motor Company. When you look at our observation deck windows right now, you're seeing Ford's electric F-150 facility being built. You know, it's right there on the campus. It's right in front of you. It is gonna be part of our mix of things we're talking about. So we're living in this right now every day. And um, I love that one in particular because it's being built on the grounds of the historic Mustang plant. So thinking about how industry is changing, how we are changing, how what we drive is changing, that's like right there. It's part of our conversation. For the museum, you know, I look at electric vehicles and, and I look at autonomous driving and I look at all of those things. And I think similarly to the pandemic where we leaned into how do we make our resources as accessible for people as we can. So we did all sorts of virtual programs. We're also thinking about how electric vehicles can make travel more accessible for people. So I imagine, you know, aging in the future and thinking about, you know, maybe I don't have to worry about keeping my license. Maybe there's autonomous vehicles that run a loop and take you to amazing cultural attractions around the area, right? Like it's my vision of how do I want to age in place in a really fun, creative way. Um, similarly, I think about what does the school bus of the future look like? We have no idea, right? Like, is that an autonomous shuttle that picks you up? Um, we recently acquired uh, a test vehicle that University of Michigan had that was an autonomous shuttle on their campus. And we acquired not only the vehicle, we acquired some of their data because they were in, they were asking these questions about how do people feel riding these things, right? This is a huge change. And, you know, am I comfortable yet with, with not a person behind a wheel? I'm not sure. Do I predict I might become comfortable? 
Yeah, I do. Because I've lived through a lot of change in my life. And I know that this change is coming. Well, and just think back to the beginning of the automobile. People weren't comfortable then either. Oh, we went yeah. from, you know, horse and buggies. So yeah. change happens change and happens. we adapt it. That's the one thing that's constant is change it's happens. absolutely constant. And I also think back to that early age of the automobiles, you know, we didn't even know. So if you look at some of the vehicles in our collection, some of them have steering wheels, some of them don't. They have tillers like a boat, right? Like we didn't know even how we wanted to drive this thing. We didn't know how to power it. So we have vehicles, very, very early vehicles that were powered by steam. We have um, a 1913 electric vehicle, which is one of my favorites in our collection. You know, so we didn't really know what a vehicle was going to be. And I love to think about how that was such a creative time. And similarly, we're in a super creative time right now about, you know, figuring out the best way to give, I like to think about it as democratized mobility. So how do you give mobility to the most people in the best way for them, for our planet? You know, we're asking these really big questions and I love that. And it really is, uh, I think now more so than ever, getting back to innovation and thinking outside of the box. Yes. If we've all learned one thing in this crisis, the COVID-19 crisis. It's not how things are done. We've had to think outside the box and do things differently, which we know always sparks creativity. Absolutely. And, you know, we... Um... We are involved with Invention Convention, which is this movement with kids across the country and across the world where kids take on these big questions and they invent their solution to it. And, you know, I'll be a judge for Invention Convention over the next couple of weeks. And I can't wait to see what they've proposed, what they've come up with, because they are not tied to what was. They're tied to what can be. And I love to be inspired by that piece and then ask myself, okay, how am I part of what can be? I love that. Cynthia Jones with us here on the Mega Cash. She's a general manager for the Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation. And just another minute or two, Cynthia, how are you guys looking when it comes to employees? Because so many businesses are struggling right now. So we're struggling. Um, you know, thank you from the bottom of my heart to all of the employees that are with us, to the incredible core of volunteers we have. But that said, for us to expand our operations, to bring back more and more and more, we need to bring back people. And, you know, as I said, we're a nonprofit. We don't pay a lot. We have a phenomenal working environment. We have a, a great opportunity. And, it, and I say that, and it doesn't matter what you do for us. It is a phenomenal place to be working. So we're out there hiring right now. If you're interested in part-time work with us, please apply. Uh, you know, I'm hiring presenters. If you love uh, racing and mobility, we just opened Driven to Win, our new racing exhibition. You could work there right in the thick of it. You could work in Henson this summer. So there's lots of good ways to engage with us. We're also looking for volunteers. Well, and definitely. We're, you're such an important part of our community. Uh, Cynthia Jones, General Manager for the Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation. We so appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. And again, you can always find out more information on their website. Uh, when does the Jim Henson exhibit start again? Jim June? Henson opens uh, June 5th and it runs through Labor Day. So you have the summer to come see us. Uh, Greenfield Village, come on out now. You can see the baby lambs and then look ahead to June with all that's coming with Motor Muster. Well, thank you again for being with us. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, talking about employment. Uh, we'll be talking with the manager for the Oakland County Workforce Development and director for the Oakland County Michigan Works. That's next here on the Megacast. Wearing a mask is more than protection. It's a bridge to better days. The path back to celebrations with family. Nights out on the town with friends. Game days with your favorite sports teams. And the thrill of live concerts. 
until we can all get the COVID-19 vaccine and build community immunity, which will take time. We all need to continue to stay careful because Michigan's recovery is depending on you. And so are your family, friends, and neighbors. So even after you're vaccinated, wear a mask, avoid large gatherings, and social distance. One day in the near future, we will all be able to put this pandemic behind us. But until then, spread hope, not COVID. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. here on the Friday edition of the Megacast. Uh, I will say so many um, companies right now are struggling because they can't find enough employees. There are good jobs out there and to help you try to snag one of them, Jennifer Llewellyn joins us. She's the manager for the Oakland County Workforce Development and director for the Oakland County Michigan Works. Great to have you with us here again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. I really feel like this conversation is shifting. You know, early on this time last year, we were talking about there weren't enough jobs. And now (laughs) it's like almost a complete swing. Yeah, I remember, you know, Ronnie, we talked last year about, you know, the 100,000 plus people that had filed for unemployment benefits last spring in Oakland County. And, and here we are now hearing every day from our Oakland County businesses that they're just scrambling for, for talent and, and need individuals from entry level positions to high level positions. So it does, it feels like a, a switch almost got flipped and um, there's cr- tremendous opportunities available out there right now. When I was on the website earlier, not only do you list the companies and the job, but you're also seeing uh, some of these companies list multiple openings. Yes, yes. We're hearing from our businesses, you know, obviously um, before the pandemic, uh, Oakland County had a very low unemployment rate, about 3.5%. And most people don't realize we've actually returned to that unemployment rate in Oakland County. So we're back around 3.5%. The challenge is is that a number of people, particularly women, have dropped out of the workforce. They've got young students at home, children at home that are still online learning, um, or maybe there's health conditions that um, are causing them pause before returning to the workforce. So really we've had to shift our efforts to how do we get individuals that have dropped out of the workforce to come back into the workforce to fill those multiple positions at companies. So uh, Jennifer, I know you have some uh, programs going on. Before we jump into that, what is it um, that some of these employers have to do to try to get these employees back? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, really being innovative, uh, being engaged with multiple partners, you know, reaching out to their local school systems, partnering with their local community college or university. Um, but we've really been working with companies to make sure that their job postings reflect the job and even reflect what COVID-19 safety measures they've put in place, you know, assuring um, applicants on how their environment is uh, safe for them, uh, for the new employees, and really making sure that wages are competitive. Um, you know, it's a job seeker market right now. So, you know, it's it's multiple factors, um, flexible hours if they offer them, um, opportunities to work hybrid or virtually. So, you know, finding what the pain points are for applicants and then touching on those in the job posting or the job description and just using really innovative recruiting methods. Well, do you think that um, it's going to ease as we go into the fall, because I know, as you mentioned, a lot of women are leaving the workforce and you wonder too, how long is it going to take us to get back to where we were? But it's, we know it's been hard for these parents because the kids remote learning, they're back in the classroom, they're only there for so many days. And so that's really been one of the major factors, the childcare. So do you anticipate uh, through the summer or we get into the fall 
and kids get back into the classrooms, that's going to help ease some of this pain for the employers? I, I think it will. Um, you know, there's a, a report from the state that estimates about 150,000 women statewide have dropped out of the workforce during the pandemic. So I'm hopeful with the vaccination efforts. Um, and, and it's not even just the online learning, but I know for myself, I have a 13 year old and a 17 year old, they've been quarantined uh, multiple times for exposure, um, you know, in, in school. And so it's really hard as a parent to find that balance between, you know, leaving your kids at home and what if they get quarantined and what if you get quarantined and then they're online and then they're back in the classroom. And so um, hopefully with, you know, uh, vaccinations and uh, the COVID numbers coming down and return to, you know, in-person learning in the fall, I hope that we can get more, more women in particular, but many people uh, back into the workforce safely and comfortably. Well, and we know there are so many jobs that you can't do remotely. You Correct. have to do it in person. But, you know, a lot of these jobs, especially if we could talk about the healthcare industry, it, these jobs require training. So it's not like they could fill the position overnight. Uh, there's a program that uh, Beaumont is launching. Do you want to tell us more about that? Yeah, that's yeah, that's a great example of uh, a position that you have to learn on the job. Uh, we, in partnership with Oakland Community College and Beaumont Health System, launched a sterile processing technician program. And and I have to commend Beaumont. You know, they really um, shared with us that this was a, a talent pain point for them. And our partners at OCC quickly responded. Uh, but the the group worked together on how do we create this talent pool. Uh, for Beaumont, how do we create a career pathway and a career trajectory for residents of Oakland County? Uh, so this program is, it's a hybrid program. Portions of the, the coursework are online. And then obviously there's pieces that are in person. Uh, each cohort we fill, some of the students are um, from the general public and some of the students are from a Beaumont health system. Maybe they're currently working as a patient transporter and they're looking for a career pathway or a trajectory within the health system. Uh, and that's really, you know, our efforts is how do we partner education, government and business together to offer real training programs and real solutions instead of just educate and pray or train and pray model. You know, how do, how do we really work together to help businesses craft uh, the talent pools that, that they need? Well, and we know for some businesses, it's been a struggle because they haven't been able to bring interns into their buildings and their facilities, which would sometimes be that pipeline uh, to help them fill that gap. Uh, Jennifer Llewellyn with us here on the MegaCast. She's the manager for the Oakland County Workforce Development and director for the Oakland County Michigan Works Program. Uh, we do know that for uh, so many people, a block for them to be able to get jobs and good paying jobs centers around their criminal record. Uh, but there is an effort right now to help some of the uh, people experiencing that to clean up their records. Do you want to tell us more about that? Yeah. yeah. To your point, Ronnie, earlier about, you know, how do we get more individuals back in the workforce? You know, Clean Slate is a, is a perfect example of that. Uh, the Michigan work system across the state uh, was graciously awarded $4 million from the state of Michigan to implement uh, clean slate programming or expungement services uh, to individuals who are, are eligible for expungement. Uh, there are studies that show that only about 6.5% of people who are eligible to have their records expunged actually apply for services. So our goal was to make um, application for expungement easy um, to help overcome some of the barriers of, of why people don't apply. Maybe they are intimidated by the process or they don't know where to start or they can't afford the legal fees. Uh, so we launched the Oakland County Clean Slate Program last Wednesday. Um, I'm proud to report as of yesterday, we already had 785 individuals that had applied for services. Uh, so we're in the process of evaluating those applications and uh, conducting the background checks to see if they meet the parameters and they're eligible for expungement services. Wow, that number is uh, quite shocking in such a few days. Wow. We were we were thrilled. Um, I, I tell many people, you know, our, our 
expertise really is workforce development programs. And we can we can launch uh, workforce development programs with our eyes closed, but launching an expungement program was a, a new experience for us. It's not something we've been involved with before, an important piece of workforce. Um, and so it was uh, quite a undertaking to launch this. And we weren't sure, are we gonna get seven applicants or 700 applicants, but we're thrilled with those early numbers um, very early on. And I think it speaks to the importance and the number of people that are out there that just don't talk about um, their criminal backgrounds uh, for a variety of reasons. So with that, Jennifer, are these mainly people with misdemeanors or are we talk of felonies? It's, it's, a, it's a range. Um, you know, what we are finding is that many of, of the individuals, maybe it was something, a mistake that they made when they were quite younger. Um, and it's still out there. Uh, and for many of them, they are working, they're in successful careers, um, but maybe hesitant to switch jobs to another employer or even apply for a promotion um, out of fear that uh, their employer will find something that they maybe didn't know about before. Uh, it also interferes with housing opportunities and uh, employment opportunities, educational opportunities. So this is important, um, not just in the workforce space, obviously that's that's a key piece, but housing and, and other elements and quality of life are, are equally as important as well. Yeah, we should note that a lot of times if you have a felony on your record, you cannot rent apartments. Um, there are so many limitations to having that felony, just as you mentioned, in which that also goes into impacting your future and your future opportunities. So it's great that you're able to uh, offer this program. Um, do you have a threshold as to how many people you're going to be able to take? We, we don't at this point, um, but obviously there's limited number of dollars available. Uh, we did bring one attorney on board and um, you know, based on early numbers, we're evaluating capacity. Uh, at this point, we're still taking those applications and we're working very closely with uh, the courts and the clerk's office and the sheriff's office to find ways that we can streamline, you know, how do we streamline the background checks? How do we streamline uh, court cases, applications, fingerprinting to make sure that we're doing this in the most efficient and cost effective way so we can serve as many individuals as possible. Boy, when they talk about uh, companies pivoting and changing through the pandemic, <laughs> you're, you're right along with everyone else. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, workforce development's an interesting place to be because we're almost counter cyclical to the rest of, of the world. You know, for, for us, it's um, when things slow for other areas, it's very busy for us. And uh, the last year has really been an interesting uh, pivot for our team going from last year serving hundreds of thousands of individuals, you know, filing for unemployment claims. Now this year, you know, servicing hundreds of employers that are scrambling for talent. So with that, Jennifer, can we ask too, because we know that uh, some employers say they may get 150 applicants, but only two or three will actually show up for the interview because as part of the process, obviously you have to show that you're able to get an interview, but the applicants aren't following through because they're, you know, not really interested in trying to get the job. What do you have answers and solutions or advice for employers out there right now? You know, I think there's multiple factors happening. There's so many places hiring and we're hearing from folks that they might get four interviews in the same week and they're getting offered jobs on the spot. We had one employer that said, you know, just show up tomorrow and you can have the job. And so when um, they invite folks in for interviews and they're, they're not showing, um, it's not always that they, they don't want to work, but it could be that they've just got another offer uh, someplace else. So you know, again, encouraging employers to continue to be creative, use referrals from within, making sure that their job postings um, are reflective of, of any uh, COVID related accommodations, uh, making sure their safety protocols are clear uh, and, and being, you know, clear around flexibility, you know, what happens if I do have to be quarantined, what happens if my children have to be quarantined, and making sure that that's visible in, in the process, because it, it does cause folks some pause, especially people with pre-existing conditions that maybe haven't been vaccinated yet. Um, you know, there's some hesitancy, or as we said before, for those parents that still have children that are learning at home through the rest of the school year, um, maybe flexibility and safety is key for them. 
So with that, other than the restaurant industry and the hospitality industry, what jobs are you seeing really need to be filled right now? Huge demand in the warehousing and transportation uh, sector. So I think we're all guilty of uh, ordering a lot from Amazon and online <laughs> over the course of the last year. So we're certainly seeing an increased demand for drivers. Um, we're seeing an increased demand in the healthcare systems. Um, the, the, the pain of the last year uh, for many of our healthcare workers, uh, some of them have retired. Um, they've maybe transitioned to other careers. So everything from you know, entry level positions within the health healthcare industry. Uh, we had a meeting with Beaumont and they had you know, thousands and thousands of jobs available and posted on their website. So great opportunities there. Um, advanced manufacturing uh, was uh, a, a growing field uh, pre-pandemic. We did have a bit of a pause, but that continues to grow. Um, the construction industry, again, as, as that uh, effort continues, you're seeing more infrastructure investment, both nationally and, and within Michigan. So, you know, really those sectors, advanced manufacturing, health sciences, uh, transportation and logistics, um, information technology, um, huge demand there pre-pandemic. We saw the spike during the pandemic as we all became Zoom experts and uh, that growth continues as well. It's funny because this conversation with you the last time was really focused on, you know, those seeking jobs, how they yes. can put their best face forward and trying to get some of these jobs. And now it's really the opposite. I, I will say one of the great things I think that's going to come out of the pandemic, some of the opportunities that are being made available to Michigan res, re, uh, residents rather to go back to college and try to help us fill, especially those trade areas. Absolutely. We have been working, uh, you know, Governor Whitmer set the 60 by 30 goal to have 60% of Michigan's residents have an industry recognized credential degree certification by 2030. Um, in Oakland County, we're, we've already exceeded that threshold. About 61% of our residents have uh, certifications, degrees, and credentials. And so uh, County Executive Coulter We've, we've set a pretty robust goal to have 80% of our population have a credential or higher by 2030, and we've already embraced those efforts in partnership with our community colleges and our universities across Oakland County, as well as our nonprofit uh, organizations. So we're really uh, working with individuals, whether they're uh, working, unemployed, uh, just returning to the workforce. Maybe they've uh, been a, a stay-at-home dad or a stay-at-home mom or maybe working in the gig sector, trying to get them back into education to earn those industry-recognized credentials. We offer financial support um, through Oakland County Michigan Works for eligible individuals up to $4,000. Um, we're assisting individuals with applying for Pell. There's great opportunities of Pell grants that you don't have to pay back. And then state programs like Futures for Frontliners and Michigan Reconnect that offer tuition um, at the community colleges for uh, individuals 25 and over for Reconnect. They can get free tuition um, to go back to school if they have less than an associate's degree. So there's plenty if, if finances are a barrier um, to someone returning to school to get that degree that they started and didn't finish or, or maybe pursue that certification that they've always wanted to pursue. This is a great time uh, to, start, to start working on that. It really is. Take advantage of it because we do you know uh, college has become so crazy expensive over the past 10, 15 years. So this is such a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Even if you aren't trying to go for a bachelor's, to get that associates or to get some type of certificate in a trade makes you so much more marketable for those higher paying jobs. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes it's not always about a new job, but a, a career pathway and a career trajectory. We have a, we're still pulling some data, but we have a fair number of residents in Oakland County that have some college and no degree. So working closely with Oakland Community Colleges and Oakland University and, and Baker and Lawrence Tech and Walsh to see, you know, how do we help those individuals get from where they are back to earn that certification or, or complete that degree? 
Um, we know that employers, as we've discussed, are clamoring for talent and an educated and skilled workforce is uh, going to not only give our residents an advantage, but our businesses an advantage. We grow the, the economic growth of, of the community. We grow the tax base. And so, you know, this educational effort has been really important to the county. And you'll be hearing a lot more about Oakland 80 in the years to come. So with that, Jennifer Llewellyn with us, uh, she's the manager for the Oakland County Workforce Development and director for the Oakland County Michigan Works. Is it okay for someone that is uh, interviewing for jobs right now and they get multiple offers, can they go back and negotiate to try to get a better offer from one employer? Always negotiate. It's it's hard. You know, it, it is hard to... Um, to put yourself out there and to um, to ask, and women in particular have sometimes a, a more difficult time with that. I, I think you have to um, be strategic about it. Uh, do your research. Find out are the wages competitive. You know, look at the full package. What does the benefits package look like? What does the vacation package look like? Um, what do what are the other opportunities for career growth within the organization? What's the culture of the organization? So yes, always negotiate. That's a um, you know kind of a mantra that I have. You know, doing a full evaluation of the full offer. But you know, it's it's a fine line. It, it really is a fine line of uh, disqualifying yourself if you if you're asking for too much or things that might be unreasonable. Yeah, and we do know that um, right now, sometimes that higher paying job now isn't the best one for you or your long-term success as well. So try to navigate that and look down the road as well. Uh, Jennifer Llewellyn with us here on the Megacast. Anything maybe I didn't ask that you want to add? I just wanted to add information on our virtual workshop series. So we have two separate virtual workshop series happening right now. One that's focused on uh, career programming. So if you'd like to participate in a resume writing workshop, interviewing workshop, um, navigating job search workshop, all of those are available online and they are um, real time. So you can ask questions from the instructor. It's just a really great opportunity to um, refine your job search skills. And those are available on uh, Oakland County Michigan Works website at oaklandcountymiworks.com. Uh, and then we also in April launched a financial fitness series uh, focused on financial literacy and financial wellness. There's a direct correlation between workforce success and, and financial challenges. Um, so there are some great workshops in partnership with our credit unions and our banks and other nonprofit organizations. We've got one on improving your credit score, one on building and repairing credit, home buying, um, cash crunch, and how to manage your money during uh, a pandemic or, or challenging times. Uh, and those are also available on our website as well. We've already had 160 individuals participate in the last month on those uh, financial wellness workshops. So, you know, great opportunities right available on our website and our Facebook, um, Oakland County Michigan Works Facebook and Twitter are great locations to get more information about all of our programs and services. Well, Jennifer, we always appreciate your time. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you for having me again. It's always great to be here. Hey, Jennifer Llewellyn, she's the manager for the Oakland County Workforce Development and the director for the Oakland County Michigan Works. There are jobs out there, great jobs. Go ahead, seek them out and also all the other opportunities so that you can have a brighter future ahead. Hopefully this crisis means better things for our community. With that, we're going to take a quick break here on the Mega Cast. Uh, when we come back, we'll be joined by our good friend, Senator Rosemary Bear, coming up here next on the Mega Cast. Finally, I just got my COVID-19 vaccine. I registered with my local health department and they called me. I got mine at the pharmacy and my neighbor got hers from the hospital. I'm not a techie person, so I called the COVID hotline and they helped me schedule an appointment. Get vaccinated with the first vaccine you can. Protect us all. Learn more at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. COVID-19 has caused many families to fall behind on finances and on groceries, but you're not alone. You shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table. 
MyBridges offers access to quality food and income assistance to help families across the state get the food support they need. It's easy to apply and easy to start shopping. Apply for services at michigan.gov slash MIBridges. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Just about 15 minutes left here in the Friday edition of the Megacast. And if we can just go ahead and jump into our last guest, Senator Rosemary Bear joins us here on the Megacast. She, of course, represents District 12. Senator, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, Ronnie. It's always good to be here with you both. Hello, Tyler. There are so many things uh, for us to uh, touch on. Do you want to just jump in? Let's start with the budget. How are things sure, looking I've there? Kind of been consuming so much of my time lately. Honestly, it's uh, really an interesting thing to work on. I'll say that. Uh, we were sort of locked in a room together for a couple of days this week as trying to get the uh, the set of all the budgets from the for the state out of the Senate. So the process, just to really quickly remind people what it is, um, the governor sent uh, a draft proposal for the budget earlier this year to the House and the Senate. Each of those two houses comes up with their version of a budget. The two houses come together into one version that then kind of goes into that final round of conversation with the governor's office till we get one budget. And the goal is to have it done completely by the beginning of June so that the schools in particular know what to expect for next year. And um, from, from a new guy's perspective, right? This is, I'm starting my third year here. This is the first time that we've actually done it this way where we might really get it done in June, which is kind of an exciting thought and will really make a difference for our schools. Yeah, I know a lot of superintendents that would make them very happy because it makes it hard for them to plan when they don't have the budget. And everything is so different right now because of the COVID-19 crisis and the additional money that is coming in because of that crisis. Exactly. They can't even rely on what they did last year. This year is nothing like last year. And the last year is nothing like the year before that. So everything is about planning right now and trying to figure out their next steps. And so not knowing how much money they're going to get from the state. We're, we're sort of got estimates on what will happen with the federal money, but even that might be wrong. And even as they've talked about the next set of uh, supports coming out of the federal government, again, the word education is coming up. So uh, we may get more, more support yet. So that's good. I mean, it gives people the opportunity to think of things in the immediate need space, right? We know there are many things that have to happen because of the virus and all the recovery that we have to do, learning delay to overcome, um, but also gives the opportunity to think about longer term investments. Are there things that we could actually do differently or major changes that we've been wishing we could do? So it's pretty exciting for the education space in particular, this, um, the ARP money that's the America's Rescue Plan money that's supposedly coming in shortly um, is $4 billion for our public education system, just that one piece, 10 billion for state and local government. So that's a that's a lot of money coming in that we didn't have last year. So it makes a big difference in our budget planning. So we sat and went through all the budgets. So that starts with, you know, school aid is one piece of that. The Department of Education has its own budget. There's a DNR budget at Eagle, the Great Lakes Energy and Environment budget. Um, every single health and human services is our single biggest component is about half of the state money, much of which is prescribed by the federal government. There's only a smaller part of that that we can actually decide what to do with. Much of it is already determined in advance. Uh, but then all the other budgets, the general fund has everything from corrections to um, the governor's office to how much we spend on IT to how much, you know, so many things fit together. So we, I am uh, the minority vice chair on the school budgets, the school aid budget, as well as the Department of Education. And so we spent a lot of time on that. We actually worked together to put together a draft, um, you know, the two parties in the Senate side uh, to put together a draft for the, the approvals last week. And we um, really, it was, it was exciting. We had to increase the um, allowance, the foundation allowance by, over $300 million for this year, which was even higher than what the governor had proposed. So that was pretty exciting. Um, an additional 41, over 41 million just for special ed, an increase in special ed funding 
um, increases 20 million in mental health, um, improvements in child care, improvement, you know, making it more available to families, um, offering more uh, compensation for the providers, for teachers of great start. We have um, increased the foundation allowance for the for great starts preschool to be the same as kindergarten. So, uh, which is good. I mean, all the studies show that it actually costs more to teach four-year-olds than it does five-year-olds, but at least now we've gotten them to the same. So in the Senate version, there's many, many good things that are improved. We kind of got surprised by something at the very end that we didn't expect, and so we couldn't pass it uh, uh, from the Democratic side. We're hoping that that can still get fixed um, by the time it comes to the floor next week, and we'll have agreement on that. Most of the budgets were contentious. There were, you know, not always, there's not always agreement on how things go when, you know, we're both sitting in the appropriations room together. Um, but the one thing that happened that, that was overarching, I think, uh, outside of the school budgets, the idea was we fix our staffing at levels from last December. And, and so in all the budgets were cuts on uh, FTEs, which means reducing the size of, of the services, the, the level of services that each of these departments can provide. So for example, when you cut people in the Secretary of State's office, that means longer lines, longer waits in the Secretary of State's office. And it's that basic, right? That's a people-driven business. And so they decided to freeze the number of people at the end of last year. And the problem with that is there was a hiring freeze for the eight months before that. And so we were already way understaffed and now we're frozen and cannot even get back to where we were a year ago. So. Um, there's definitely some things that need to get adjusted. So that last two phases, one working with the House and then the last one working with the governor's office, um, hopefully we will get past some of those kind of issues because we still need to have Secretary of State's offices open. I mean, we can't literally close those. I mean, it would be interesting if we could do everything online, but we haven't been able to do that, obviously. Um, so there's, there's still things that we haven't agreed on, but it is a fascinating uh, way to work. And, and sitting there, you know, kind of negotiate between two parties and now between two houses and then between the administration and, you know, it's all negotiations all the time. But it's good to see, or at least it sounds like the two sides are negotiating because we have seen there's been such a divide between the GOP and the Democrats in Lansing throughout this pandemic, especially around restrictions in schools. Yes. And we did do a lot of work together. I, it, you know, it's not perfect. I, I at least on the school side, um, we we did work together, and and things are are better. I, it is not true in every part of the government, um, because they're run by pin committees, and committees have chairs, and you know, different ideas on how things should go. Um, so that you know, some are better than others. One of the challenges that in one of mine that that I work on is the environmental budgets. So the um, Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy and the DNR budgets. Um, we live in Michigan and we are the water state and we have are experiencing like many others, like all other states probably, the, the problem that we're having with aging infrastructure. And so um, in 2002, the people of Michigan voted for a clean water fund so that we could update and maintain water infrastructure and make sure people have access to fix things when they break like septic systems or sewer systems or just to be able to have clean water coming to your well and so um, the governor had proposed that we use that money that was approved in 2002 for a clean water fund for grants for anyone across the state to fix their broken systems whatever that is to repair their infrastructure so they have clean running water and a way to dispose of water effectively and that got taken out. And, and that was just a huge, like, you know, to my heart, no, that's our water. You have to take care, we have to take care of our water. So we're gonna fight that one as hard as we can <laughs> to get yeah, that back in there. Especially to do that. You know, in the middle of the pandemic, we've all come to appreciate our environment so much more than I think we have in previous years. Yes, honestly, we just depend on those things so much. So, and we are more and more, you know, I also work on transportation, um, which we 
did a great job on that one too. There's there's some differences that you know as an environmentalist, I really favor rail transport as much as possible. So they did a little squeeze on that, and I wanted to unsqueeze it. Um, but overall, it was a good you know good work, and uh, um, and because we know that we have infrastructure that needs to be fixed, and the governor had proposed some work right now as soon as possible, getting some of these bridges that are actually some of them failed others critically failing that I wouldn't want to drive over. Um, and so it looks like that's going to happen. So, you know, so there is, there are good things. There are places where really good things are happening and other places where we have more work to do. So if I can ask you, because when we're talking about the budgets and the money, I wonder about our future generations, because I know a lot of people say, oh, it's federal money. At the end of the day, it's all tax dollars. It's all our How money. many generations are going to have to pay for the money that we're receiving today? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I will say when you think back, if you are a historian and looked at, at, at Roosevelt and the New Deal that he put in place after the war, right? We were so, people were so desperately needing some, some work. They need, you know, we're in that, we, they, there was a, a, a dire lack of infrastructure work going on. And so by putting those programs in place, and, and in the, largely these are very much the same kinds of programs, right? We'll have, people will have jobs that will pay good enough, right? I mean, this is how our economy as a whole needs to recover. So even outside of the, the cost of the pandemic, the, the, we have been seeing a decline in people's real actual take home pay for uh, more than a generation. And what's happening is people then have to work two jobs or in sometimes in a family, three jobs. And then one of those jobs just pays for childcare because we're not paying enough. I mean, we basically have to up level the whole economy to get us to the place where everybody's earning an income that pays their bills, right? And then we're all moving forward again. So this is sort of like unsticking. And at the same time, we are going to repair and replace the infrastructure that we've let sit there for 80 years that's failing. I mean, so we are, it's a double win for us. It will move everything forward, which is how our economy repairs itself. You know, the way we're going now, we're not going to repair anything. We've got to change directions a little bit here. We're talking with uh, State Senator Rosemary Baer. She uh, represents the 12th district. And I will say if people actually saw the, the ratings for the bridges, they'd be very afraid as well. Um, and I don't know if uh, you, you know some industry can make those public. I know before I've had to FOIA them and it really is eye-opening yeah. uh, when we look it's at that. It's kind of scary when you think about where you drive every day. It really is, it really is. Just another minute or two here with you. Uh, on the mega cast. And when you're talking about the jobs, right now though, we're seeing such a shortage of employees and some businesses are having to reduce hours or you know, um, some, in some cases closing all together because they can't get enough employees. Yeah, that, that actually ties to what I was sort of leading into there with the conversation about compensation. Um, if you are, making more in unemployment than you would from your paid job, what that really is telling us is your paid job is not paying enough. Now, right now there's a boost on unemployment from the federal government, which is helping. But even then, I mean, most, uh, most uh, uh, professional workers would never be able to survive on that, on that weekly pay. It's, it's not enough to survive on. Ours, Michigan is one of the lowest in the country for what we actually give people for unemployment. So you, they together with the federal boost, you're making less than $600 a week. It is very difficult to live on $600 a week. And if you have a kid, if you have two kids, if you have three kids, you know, so think about that. So your, your employer is asking you to come back for less than $600 a week. So uh, with that, we should point out, uh, there are so many great opportunities, school opportunities right now being made right. available through the state of Michigan and uh, what a great opportunity. And let's hope people take, take advantage. advantage. Take right? advantage of that. Yeah, and Michigan Works, who you just had here as a fabulous organization, um, they too have upscaling opportunities. They do apprentice programs. They work with different organizations to help people 
raise themselves to a level where they have a skill that will help them with that particular thing. So yeah, overall, I mean, if we add all those pieces together, this is really a big opportunity for us to invest in the people of Michigan and make a huge difference to what's been happening here. I, I think we're looking at a, a future that is bright and near term. You know, and a lot of times that's what happens out of a crisis. We see mm -hmm. these silver linings. And was it never, never pass up the chance to take advantage of a crisis or, uh, you know, something like that, right? Right. Yeah. So uh, with that, uh, State Senator, we know that it's Mother's Day weekend this uh, weekend. We want to say happy Mother's Day uh, to Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you. And enjoy the time. Uh, just about uh, 10, 20 seconds left. Anything? There, I have so many things I want to ask about, but we're out of time. I know it goes by so fast. Um, <laughs> the only thing I will remind everyone is to get vaccinated because that will is the thing that is going to get us out of this as a state. We need to get as many people through that. One, we want to protect all our people. Two, we would like to get to that point where everything opens back up fully. That's, that's our big goal. And we are close. We're over 52% have had that first shot. Not that much farther to get us to 65%. We can do it. There you go. And it's easier now uh, than ever before. So thank you again to uh, Senator Bear for being with us here on the Megacast. That's going to wrap it up for the Friday edition. Uh, Tyler and I will be back Monday starting at 10 a.m.